Welcome to the Learning Can't Wait podcast, a Full Mind production. At Full Mind, our vision is to ensure every child has access to an exceptional education. Each episode, we will be joined by pathfinders within and around the education space who are bringing about transformational change on behalf of deserving students. I am your host, Haley Spearbauer. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for joining the Learning Can't Wait podcast. I am here with Dr. Rebecca Brandstetter, a school psychologist and the co-founder of Thriving Students Collective, a professional development platform created to reduce educator burnout and improve outcomes for complex learners. Rebecca, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to have you on the podcast today. I I feel like I have a lot of personal questions I want to ask you, but also professional ones. Fire away. <laughs> you know, I, I, when I was little, I wanted to be a school psychologist. I thought that the, the way to unlock children and their learning was to understand their brains and their hearts and to help them understand their brains and their hearts. I don't know if that's true. So maybe you can answer that throughout the conversation today and help us really get to the bottom of the work that you do. You know, it's funny because school psychology, when I was going through school, like there, it wasn't really known. Um, I think there's a lot more awareness about what school psychologists do. Um, But I, when I started to think about my career, I didn't even know it existed. And then when I stumbled upon it, um, it was like, basically, if a teacher and a psychologist had a baby. And I was like, this is the career for me because I was one of those kids. And I don't know if you were this way too. Like I loved learning so much that like I played school on the weekends. Okay. Like I had friends, I promise, but I also. (laughs) They were students probably. I love, I love school. And, and it always surprised me when people didn't love school and knew now as an adult reflecting back a, a lot of folks, a lot of the kids I knew who didn't love schools because they had a learning difference. They had a challenge. They had emotional challenges going on that made it hard for them. So as a school psychologist, my job is to see the potential in kids and how can we unlock it and how can we have every kid love school? Maybe they don't play it on the weekends, (laughs) but they love it and they enjoy learning and they are, you know, enjoying themselves at school. And that's what I love to do as a school psychologist. This is exactly why I have both professional and personal interest. I have a second grader, can't say school's his absolute favorite, but excited to dig in a little bit more. You you sort of answered my standard first question already, which I love, but I'll let you expand upon it further. How did you personally come to be the professional and personal version of yourself? You told us a little bit about what led you to school psychology, but obviously you're also co-founder of this incredible organization. Can you paint us a picture of your past that led you here? Oh, the origin story. Humble beginnings in 19, blah, blah, blah. No, (laughs) Um, let's start with graduate school. So I went to graduate school at Berkeley to become a school psychologist. And the model at Berkeley was really, you know, not just work with students one-on-one, but change the system, right? To make sure that all of our students are getting fair, equitable access to their education and all students are learning, including students who are neurodivergent, students of different cultures and backgrounds and it doesn't matter what their zip code is, you can serve them. And that was really appealing about being a school psychologist because not everyone can afford, nor is there access to mental health and learning supports. So I go to San Francisco Unified and I'm young and spry and <laughs> really excited to change the whole world. And it did not take me long to realize that there were systemic challenges. I had 3,000 students I was responsible for on my caseload as a school psychologist. So just Wrap your brain around that for a hot second. 3,000 kids on my caseload. Haley, I was part-time and I was writing my dissertation simultaneously on adolescent motivation. So, and I was in one of the most challenging schools because newbies often get put in the most challenging schools because, you know, they're open and people are, you know, putting you in there. So I was burning out before I even started. And I thought I was the problem. I thought if I just got more efficient, like I was one Excel spreadsheet away from success, right? (sighs) If I could just get more organized, I could serve kids faster. Um, And I started, you know, this was before Instagram, um, but, you know, I I heard about like, you know, self-care Sunday kind of energy. And and I thought, well, maybe I just need, I'm not self-caring enough. 
And so I would go and I'd walk my dog in San Francisco in these beautiful spaces. But instead of having it restore me, I spent so much time looking backwards at what I didn't get to and the kids who were falling through the cracks and then looking forward to like how anxious I was about the next day. So I really built this career on the idea that when we thrive, our students thrive. And below any MTSS pyramid on the planet, where we have cool tier one interventions for students and cool tier two supports for anyone is tier zero, which is making sure our educators are well. And that really was the nexus of um, starting this um, this business and this organization, Thriving Students Collective. It's like, who's caring for the educators? And let's go beyond taking a bubble bath at the end of the day. That's not sufficient. We need to look upstream. I was so tired of people telling me, like, you just need to self-care more and go to the gym and all these things. Those are great. I'm pro self-care, but I needed something different. So I dug into the research about how do you not just survive as a school psychologist and educator, but thrive. That is, I I have to go back to this 3000 number because that's so much, that's so common to have folks working on the mental health of students be inundated with the number of cases they have. Oh, wow. That like, it just, I, I do have to take a pause for a second because that's the reality when mental health is at its all time worst for students and for educators, that's the reality that they wake up with and enter schools with every day. So what led you to where you are now? So you you obviously identified that self-care is not enough. Being efficient and organized is not enough. What is enough? What What is the, the work that you're doing and the solution that you've created? And how does it fundamentally expand the capacity of folks supporting school students? Well, there was a culminating moment where I was on that precipice of quitting. And I think maybe all your listeners out there have had that moment. Like, is this the week that I just have to say, like, I can't do this anymore. I love my students, but I I hate my life. And that's where I was, you know, sort of mid-career. Um, I switched districts a couple of times because I thought the grass was greener. And the caseloads were smaller in some districts, but the needs were higher. So it all kind of just was different grass. It wasn't greener. So I, this is ironic, (laughs) you like this story. So one day I'm at my school district and I'm actually six months pregnant with my daughter who's now in middle school. And I am trying to write psychoeducational reports for those school psychs out there or anyone involved in special education, you know the vibe, they're very lengthy. And I was trying to really be a good school psychologist and finish my work. I went to the district office and there was a lockdown on campus for someone, a gunman had come on campus. And I'm huddled under my desk, clutching my pregnant belly and being like, what am I doing? Right? What am I doing here? This is not just my stress anymore. This is my kid's stress. So on the way home, I'm crying and I call my husband. I'm like, I can't be a school psychologist anymore, even though I love my students. And he, I'm like, I don't know how we're going to get health insurance, but I'll talk to the guy. Like it was a whole thing. I was going to quit. And then Josie Bass Publishers reached out to me that week, ironically. I was like, do you want to write a book called The School Psychologist Survival Guide? And I was like, well, that's super ironic. <laughs> how much does it pay? <laughs> no. And so I, I took the I took the the challenge. And I dug into the research. What does it take, given the current reality of being overworked and underutilized and under-resourced, how can you still get your work done and then not sacrifice your life? So I uncovered four pillars of thriving. And I started out, you know, implementing these four pillars with myself and in my book and with others. And then that evolved to the Thriving School Psychologist, which is an online course and community just for school psychologists. And now I I started that in 2017. And uh, longitudinal data is that school psychs take it. They are less stressed out. They are um, happier at work and they do more intervention and prevention and they're less likely to quit. So you're probably wondering out there, wait, what are these four pillars? <laughs> like, Give me the pillars yes, now. Definitely, <laughs> please tell us. You're like, okay, I get the sob story. Let's get to the results, right? Okay. So the first pillar is around organization, time management. There's certainly things that, um, you know, productivity research, science-backed habits. And now with AI, there's ways to automate your workflow, to free up more time to be with students and do what you love. The second pillar is really around um, looking at the wiring instead of putting out fires all day long. Okay, so a lot of times teachers and principals are putting out fires, right? And so it's really about stepping back, like, why so many fires? (laughs) What's the wiring? A classic example is I was a school psychologist in a middle school where I was getting a ton of referrals for ADHD. 
And I was testing tons and tons of kids. And I was like, but wait, really the problem what we're trying to solve for is executive functioning weaknesses. What if we spitballing here did an intervention for the whole eighth grade around executive functioning? And lo and behold, kids got served faster and my caseload went down and my stress went down. So it's really about looking at the wiring and the teacher's examples might be that like around classroom management, around putting systems in place. And for principals out there, it might be around your MTSS team. The third pillar is really around collaboration and connection. So this is one of those things that sounds intuitive, but we don't always do. So for school psychologists, they're often in a silo of suffering. They're the only one in their school. And so if you're a special service provider, you might be in that scenario. Um, and teachers, you may be in your classroom all day and you don't get to collaborate. You don't get little think time. And, and no one understands, you know, after a hard day, you, you know, who, who do you want to talk to? You don't want to talk to someone else. You want to talk to someone who knows what you're going through. So talking to a teacher bestie, talking to a school psych bestie, it's really the, the third pillar is around connecting and collaborating with your people. And then the fourth pillar is about really understanding the science of burnout prevention, the science of self-care. And I'm not just talking about behavior. I'm talking about what comes before self-care. And if you'll so indulge me, I know I've been talking a long time. I will tell you <laughs> one of the game changers um, for that fourth pillar about how why self-care is not enough and what you can do instead. But I'll pause there and let you reflect on those four pillars. It's like you know how to talk to people and make sure that there's space for understanding. Uh, I love it. I love it. You, you clearly are an educator and, and very much understand. Uh, this is, you know, these are really important. I think that, you know, I look at schools all day long. I work, I work at hundreds of schools around the United States. I hear very similar problems. I'm a rabid consumer of the news. And you've touched on so many of the components of, what's causing burnout right now for educators. Uh, in addition to being underpaid, underappreciated, there's a whole there's a whole other aspect there that I don't think this necessarily addresses, but probably tangentially so. So so I am curious though, for this what's before burnout. I, I do want to hear what you have to say. Well, one of the things that you know, I've been around enough to education. I'm a school psych for 20 years now. Every year of school psyching is a dog year, though. So, like, it's 140 years under my belt. <laughs> you know the vibe. So, when I first started out, it was sort of the messaging was, like, remember your why. I don't know if you've been around long enough to know the remember your why movement. Just remember why you're doing this, why you're burning yourself to the ground. And that's what I used for a good 10 years. It's like, I love the kids, so I'm going to keep going, right? And then it evolved to self-care Sunday, which is take time after work to decompress. And that's the, the key to success. And what we're seeing now, Haley, is really a movement towards the science of micro habits, mindset shifts, and small behavioral changes. So I'll talk a little bit about a mindset shift first, and then I'll talk a little bit about some behavioral strategies that I go across the country telling educators in our professional development um, trainings and online in our how to reverse educator burnout course on what they can do about them. So one micro habit that I think is really important is to understand that, you know, rest is not an after work activity, that mindfulness doesn't have to take forever and ever. No one has to sit on a, you know, Himalayan mountaintop for days in silence to enjoy the benefits of mindfulness. So rest is not a reward for a job well done at the end of the day. Rest and mindfulness and pausing during the workday is actually restorative. I'll give you a concrete example, too. So a lot of times when I ask educators, I just did a training in Jefferson County School District in Colorado, and I said, when do you rest? And then there was like a moment of silence. People are like, summer, uh, 10 at night, like they really almost had to like think about when they rest. And it, that's often the pattern. It's a sprint, right? We sprint till... Uh, fall break, we sprint till and we rest after that. So, you know, the mindset, our, our, our brains love to be correct, by the way. Like who likes to be right out there? Raise your hand. Haley, do you like to be right? Everybody. <laughs> I love it. So the stories we tell ourselves, such as I'll rest when I'm done. Our brains love to be right. So they start to scan for like, okay, I'll rest when I'm done. So therefore I'm not going to rest right now because I'm not done. And we continue the behavioral pattern. 
Or if your story in your brain is like, I'm not appreciated, your brain starts scanning for evidence to be right. Yeah, that's right. That teacher didn't say thank you, right? So we can continue to be in these negative cycles. So at the end of the workday, I want to invite teachers, admins, school psychs, whoever's out there uh, listening to do this. When you look at that Friday work bag, you know, the Friday work bag energy, you're like, should I or shouldn't I? Yeah, it's that extra tote that just like is sitting next to your desk with everything in it. You're deciding to yourself, am I bringing this with me to the thing I'm doing right now? Am I leaving it here? How much time am I going to have? Yep, I I know that vibe. (laughs) So here's how that plays out for me for many years. I brought home this stack of work and it would sit in the corner of my house and haunt me and I wouldn't do it. And then I'd feel bad about it. Okay. Or conversely, I'd bring it home and I'd work on it and then I would neglect time for myself and I'd feel bad about it. So either way I lost, but what I couldn't get over was like, well, it's due. Like there's an IP, it's a deadline. Like I have to, I got into this have to space. And then something really unlocked for me when I looked at the science of productivity and really rested, happy minds are more productive. And I'll just say it again, because it's so powerful. Rested, happy minds are more productive. Barbara Fredrickson talks about this broaden and build theory. So when you are happy and rested, we broaden our cognitive resources. We are more creative. We are able to see things we aren't otherwise able to see. We are more efficient. We are better able to tolerate stress. So we broaden our cognitive skills. We're better able to remember stuff. How many people, when you're stressed, you're like, oh my God, I forgot that, right? So being happy and well actually boosts your cognitive performance. It also broadens your emotional resources. So you're able to handle stress better. You have a better immune system. You're able to connect better with other humans. Haley, when you're stressed and you, the royal you, everybody, you're inward. My stress, my thing, how am I going to fix this? When you're well, you can be um, looking outward and connecting with each other. There's this concept I love. Psychologists love to come up with cool names for things that just mean something else. Positive embodied rapport and resonance. Ooh, la la. It means we're vibing. So like when you're well, you're vibing with your colleagues. I'm vibing with you right now. I'm feeling great. That positive energy comes from a well-rested mind. So I invite people out there listening when they're looking at their work bag on Friday afternoon or Tuesday or whenever it is, just instead of bringing it home, tell yourself rested, happy minds are more productive. You know the vibe. Can you do something with with a high cognitive task on a Friday afternoon at two? Or are you better fresh doing it on a Monday after a full weekend of rest? Oh, I have stories on stories on stories that could confirm this exact statement, these exact statements you're making. Yeah, no, absolutely. You cannot. You cannot. Your brain cannot function. I, I, My team actually knows that like when I hit three o'clock, if I'm not like in a good space, either I'm I'm kind of done or I have to go on a walk. And I have to get outside and I have to get fresh air and I have to not look at my phone so that I can re-engage for whatever is ahead of me the rest of the day. And that, you know, I was texting with actually a group of girlfriends, a doctor, a psychiatrist, and a social worker yesterday. And I sent a picture of myself on a walk. These are girlfriends from college and other places. And they said, wow, you're out in the middle of the day. And I said, I will not be able to function the rest of the day unless I take a break right now and like breathe the fresh air. Because my brain won't work. It just will not. It's not even worth trying. You're spot on. And you've tapped into, we know that nature is restorative and all these things. And then here's where like the research to reality gap happens. So in my how to reverse educator burnout course, I talk about the research. And then I have a team of uh, amazing contributors who are actual educators in the classroom all day. And they talk about the reality. So the reality is that a lot of teachers can't just be like, excuse me, kids, I'm feeling stressed. I'm going to go outside in nature. So one of the sort of, cool workarounds that I love to share is this, here's another psych term that's something normal that you got to sound fancy, biophilic design. Have you heard this? I haven't. Okay. So biophilic design is bringing nature in. It's having screen savers of nature. It's having plants. It's having, um, you know, I used to have these clothuses at closet office where there was no window. And I put up a picture of like Hawaii and like trick my brain to thinking I was in nature even just looking at nature videos, these things have been shown to boost calm. Um, I have done classroom emotional space makeovers. It's so, so fun for me. Like it taps into my inner HGTV star. And I just like, (laughs) 
revamp. I'm like, no, the color green must come in because the color green itself has been shown to boost calm. If you've ever been to the Oakland airport, it's covered with greenery and they're trying to like calm you down in the TSA line. So there's ways that we can take these concepts, these research concepts and turn them into reality at our work. So if you can't take a break, you know, during the school day, you can take a mental break with biophilic design. I also encourage, this is another one that's uh, really popular in my community when we talk about, you know, after presentations, like what's stuck, you know, six months later, what do you still do? The concept of embedding mindfulness in your day as something that is, you know, not an add on, but an add in. And so you don't have to sit and meditate. Um, one of the things you can do is um, during kids recess, you take an adult recess. Okay, so a habit hack is pairing something that always happens with a new habit, you're more likely to do it. So when that recess bell rings, it's a mindfulness bell, y'all. It's a mindfulness bell. You just take three deep breaths or you don't check your email. You don't get ready for the next lesson. You just breathe, <laughs> look outside, um, have a cup of tea, do something restorative. A lot of times school sites, teachers notorious for working through Breaks. Every break, rested, yeah. happy minds are more productive. Everyone say it with me in your car, wherever you're listening, rested and happy minds are more productive. This will be your new mantra. It's a way to unlock that it's okay to take breaks. We don't have to subscribe to this culture of hustle all the time. In fact, people who don't subscribe to it are actually going to be sustainable in the field. That's pillar four, y'all. I just read Atomic Habits recently, and this idea that you're naming is aligned to James Clear's like habit stacking and put put the one thing that you always do with something else you don't need, you don't do that you can put together so that you're less likely to skip it. I'm laughing right now because I do planks when my coffee's brewing because I don't want to do planks, but like <laughs> when your coffee's brewing is a good time to do planks. I do squats that. when I brush my teeth. Yeah. Well-worn habit coffee. Just, you know, don't even think about that one. And so, yeah, do a little plankerito and it's only an espresso, so it's not that long. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. There you go. Yeah. Great uh, yeah. No, I, listen, I love that you have the teachers that are in the classroom living this as part of the work you do, because it's so easy for me to say that. I no longer work in a school building. I used to rack up my last year was when I first got a device that monitored how far I walked every day. I was racking like 10 miles a day when I was a leader in a school and coming home exhausted. And I am like very vocal that I'm immunocompromised. I have chronic illness. I have since I was 10. I had to make accommodations in my day. And now I work from home in a corporate environment and I have a lot more flexibility. I get to decide when I use the bathroom. That's always the example. So I always feel guilty when talking about teachers and burnout and school because I'm like, <clears throat> I'm I'm out of that setting and I'm not doing that work right now in the same way teachers and school leaders in buildings are. So I appreciate that you have so many teachers advising and talking and sharing because not that I think you would feel otherwise. I'm like the work is so unique. And so hearing how that you have these folks that are also advising on what you're building and how they're, they're implementing it is powerful. I appreciate that because when you're in it, it's really hard to see another way. And so there's a benefit to being outside of the schools and then sort of helicoptering above and like, what is this craziness that I was in? Like if you just step back for a second you know, then you have a little more perspective. I think it was the the great poet Elsa from Frozen who said, it's funny how some distance makes everything seem small. You have kids, you know the vibe. I, I um, do. I, I was teaching when Frozen became I'm popular. So, so the amount of times I had to sing or listen to or play Let It Go for my first or kindergartners, excuse me, the ripe age of kindergarten is untenable. I cannot even measure. The limit does not exist. <laughs> Exactly. Um, and then also the great poet Anna of Arendelle was like, well, what's the next best thing from Frozen 2? I will not sing the song for you. Um, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Although I do have a Yeti mic, I could. Um, no, and the point is really that you need both outside and inside view, right? You need to be able to like hover above your life and say, wait, what am I doing? And then also be in it and have practical strategies. So that's what we really love to do at Thriving Students Collective is we have the research and then we have the reality. Um, so we're trying it on in real time. 
And, you know, I'd love to give your listeners like a, a parting little gifty poo. Um, I, I love giving something practical that folks can do. And one of the things that, and I'm going to tie it back to how mindset shifts can change your behavior. So one of the things that's like, we all like, have a hard time carving out time for self-care, right? Um, and then we can feel bad about that. Or we can feel bad about taking self-care. We can feel guilty about it. If there's any parents out there, like taking time for yourself can, you know, trigger guilt reactions. And a wise person, my therapist, once said, <laughs> thank you, Julie. Shout out to Julie. Um, she said, being centered in yourself is not self-centered. Being centered in yourself is not self-centered. Ah, and- I love that. I know Julie's amazing. If she was like, my rate is six billion dollars an hour, yes. I'd be like, do you take credit cards? Like she's amazing. <laughs> anyway, highly recommend therapy. Therapy is self-care. Um, one of the shifts though is that I did looked at the research about which people take self-care time and which people don't. And here's the fun connection. So self-compassion is something that can be done on the job when the stress is happening. Self-care is done after the job. So what is self-compassion? If anyone out there has not heard of Kristen Neff's work, she has a TED talk. It's worth 10 minutes of your life. She talks about self-compassion in a three-step process. So self-compassion first is just being mindful and aware that you're stressed. And I think teachers are pretty darn good at this. Like I feel stressed. I feel overworked. We know with kids for emotional regulation, we do name it to tame it, right? Have you heard of that one? I feel stressed. I feel worried. I feel sad. And then your amygdala shrinks yep. in the yep. reactivity. So same for y'all out there, teachers, you know, practice what we preach. First, you just name it. I feel stressed, overworked, and underappreciated, whatever it is. Maybe you've just had a horrible parent-teacher conference. Parent-teacher conferences can be triggering and stressful because, you know, there's a lot of stakes involved. So in that moment, can you go do self-care, Haley? Can you like leave that parent-teacher conference? Be like, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to do my Bali X dance class. No, you can't go get a massage, get whatever it is that your self-care is. You need something in that moment. So that mindful pause, like, wow, this is stressful. This parent's coming in hot or whatever it is. I'm projecting because I'm a school psych and I have awkward conversations for a living with like a lot of emotion around them, um, which is fair. The second piece of it is common humanity. I'm not alone. There are school psychs out there who have advocates coming at them. I'm a teacher and a lot of parents are stressed and you know, they're taking it out on me and I'm not the only teacher. I bet there's a teacher bestie who's been through this before. It's, it makes it less isolating. That's common humanity. And the third one, and this one is so essential is what would you advise a best friend to do? What would you advise a best friend to do in this moment? And the reason it's not like, what would I do is because emotionally distancing yourselves from me, myself, and I has actually been shown to be helpful for moving forward in this process. So saying like, okay, what would I advise Haley to do if a parent was yelling at her and like they left and then you're in tears? What I wouldn't say to Haley, which we tell ourselves, you know, it's true is, oh man, I didn't handle that well. I should have anticipated that they would be mad about that. I didn't say that right. I I messed that one up. I blew it. So now if I came to you and was like, Haley, I had a really hard um, conversation. Would you be like, girl, you blew it. (laughs) I'm laughing because it's like so illogical and yet it is what people do to themselves constantly as you're naming here. Yeah. So here's the fun connector for your folks out there. And then I'm going to get to my gift. Don't worry. Is when you advise people, what would you ask a best friend to do? What would you advise a best friend? The answer is self-care. You would give yourself, um, you know, some grace. You would maybe do something that feels restorative. You might get out into nature. You might do some me time to reflect. You might do some we time to like collaborate with others. You might just go and be like, is is time to just go to the gym and sweat this out, right? You will do self-care. So people who are, here's the key, I'll unlock it for you. People who are self-compassionate are more likely to do self-care. So that's the on the job and off the job strategy. Do it as a mental exercise on the job and then do the self-care off the job. So the gift I want to give you, have you heard of the love languages, Haley? Oh, I sure have. You sure have. So I have adapted the love languages, which is for those who don't know out there, it's usually for marital, like 
Um, you know, there's words of affirmation, like saying, I love you feels like love to some folks. And then acts of service feels like love. Like when your husband takes out the compost, like he loves me because he just reduced the burden in my life. And that was so stinky. And I appreciate that. Um, there's gifts, right? Like giving little gifties, there's physical, and then there's quality time. So I have retooled that to what's your self-care language. If this were a video podcast, you could see it. Um, but I have this download for you that you can give. And it gives words of affirmation, but for yourself, which might look like a gratitude practice or journaling, or it might be an act of service. Did you know that like going to your own medical appointments <laughs> is an act of service, is self-care? My kids and my dog's shots are all updated all times, but I'm like, oh man. Not, not me. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> right? Maybe it's me time, meditation, quiet reading, doing a hobby you used to do when you were little that you forgot about. If there was an eighth day of the week, what would you do? That is the answer to what self-care feels restorative. Let's ask you. It's my podcast now. Haley. Taking the mic. <laughs> if there was an eighth day of the week, what would you do guilt-free? Like no mom guilt, no nothing. It just popped out of nowhere. What would you do? I would go eat in a very delicious restaurant with people I love. Could be my family. Could be my friends. Could be a combination. I love to go out. I love to eat good food. And I love to be with people I love. I love that for you. And someone else's might be something different. It might be more like restorative on their own time. Yeah. Those, those introverts are not going to go with my hundred percent extrovert vibe. I know that for a fact. I've, I have learned that well over time. <laughs> and that's why it's so personal. Like when you say self-care, it always feels like some sort of like indulgent thing that doesn't fit you. But this download I'm going to give you has, you know, 20 different options of self-care. Pick one, circle one. Let's atomic havoc this. What's the smallest one that doesn't feel big for you? And start there because teachers and educators are givers, givers, givers. And I, I won't say empty cup, uh, an analogy. I won't do it. Um, though people say it all the time. Oxygen mask. I'm not going to say it because it doesn't make sense to me. You put on your oxygen mask before serving others, but then there's like 50 other kids on the plane. And you're like, I don't have enough time, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be overflowing because you give so much. You have to have so much self-care and you have that happiness and rest. So you're broadening and building your emotional resources. So you have extra to give, extra to give. That's why self-care is not selfish. So you can download this tool. Um, I'm sure you have show notes and whatnot, but it's um, thrivingstudents.com forward slash learning can't wait. And you can get this, what's your self-care language download. Um, some snappy little Instagram posts if you want to brag on your uh, <laughs> which one you are, if you're a words of affirmation gal, or if you're like Haley and it's uh, it's a quality, fun, we time energy. And good food. Yes, uh, that's very theory. important. I love that. And honestly, you are the first guest that's come on that has, has given a gift away and has given something uh, more substantive in nature than just the wisdom and incredible intellect and insight that you shared while on the podcast here. So thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much for that. You're yeah. welcome. I think I built this whole organization on being in terrible professional development for so many years where I could like, this is interesting, but what do I do? do now? Or this is like, how do I action on this? So that's the energy that I love to bring to podcasts. And I love to bring to our online courses and our communities is like, sure, we all know gratitude, but how do you do that in the day when, you know, you know, what's hitting the fan? It's mm -hmm. really about, it's not information. It's transformation. If information were transformation, we would all be so, so fit because we know what to do. It's about how do you apply it in your situation in a way that doesn't feel overwhelming. You know, this entire podcast has basically answered the question I typically ask guests at the end of the episode, but I'm going to ask you to be somewhat reductive in your response because you've done, as I said, that you've replied throughout the episode. But if you were giving a new teacher starting their career, any advice, what advice would you give them? I know what you're not going to say. You're not going to say, remember your why. <laughs> that much we know. But what My why is health insurance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. So what would it be? Oh gosh. All right. I'm rubbing my hands together. You can't, maybe you can hear on the podcast because this is juicy stuff. Um, be gentle with yourself. Be gentle with yourself. Treat yourself like you would a bestie teacher friend. I love that. 
I really love that. Thank you for, I mean, really concisely putting together what your message is here and sharing that out with all the listeners. Rebecca, it has been such a pleasure. You are so fun to talk to, so energetic and so passionate about this topic. I'm grateful you made time in your day to share with our listeners and to share with me what you're doing over at the Thriving Students Collective. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed our positive resonance and embody rapport moment. And hopefully you can feel that out there in the podcast space. Thank you for doing what you do, Haley, and, and bringing voices to you know these amazing educators out there who are putting in the work until it works. Absolutely. I hope there's lots of them listening here today because this has been really powerful stuff. And I'm grateful that you also gave away this free resource. Can you remind everybody one more time where to go to get that, please? You bet. Thrivingstudents.com forward slash learning. Can't wait. Amazing. Thank you everybody for tuning in and we'll talk again soon. Thanks for listening to the Learning Can't Wait podcast. If you like what you heard, please rate, review, and share this episode. Be the first to know when we have a new episode by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or have a suggestion for an episode, email us at podcast at fullmindlearning.com.